in the Enterprise Business Division of Samsung Electronics America. Samsung is one of DSE's premier exhibitors and sponsor of this year's keynote address. Samsung is proud to be a sponsor and supporter of DSE, our industry's largest conference and trade show. Please be sure to stop by the Samsung exhibit on the show floor, booth 902. We've got some great stuff um, we're exhibiting and we'd love to have you come by. One minor housekeeping note, uh, after this session, the following seminars will be held here at the Renaissance, and that is S1, S5, and S7. All other morning seminars will be held next door in the convention center on the second floor. So please consult your tickets for seminar room assignments and locations. Now it is my pleasure to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Peter Bacco, who is Chief Technology Officer for Corning Glass Technologies. Dr. Bacco is recognized as one of the foremost glass experts in the display industry. Since he started working in LCD at Corning in 1982, he has contributed to the design, technology delivery, and commercialization of advanced substrates for flat panel display in a variety of leadership positions. Currently, Dr. Bacco is responsible for new product innovation across Corning's glass, or excuse me, across Corning's glass technology businesses. He is the recipient of a special recognition award for the Society for Information Display and holds 10 patents in display and optical fiber materials. Dr. Bacco's keynote topic today is Looking Forward by Looking Back, a futuristic retrospective on the trends in display and digital signage. And I'm sure you're gonna learn a great deal from our speaker. Please welcome Dr. Peter Bacco. video, which I am really gratified that so many of the people that I've run into at DSC have, uh, have actually seen. Um, we did a sequel to this uh, in 2012. Uh, actually, it was released uh, about a month after I attended this conference last year. So uh, many of you may have also seen this one too, but if you don't mind, it'll take about, I think, uh, seven minutes of our time. I'm going to start uh, by showing... I'm going to start by showing uh, uh, the uh, Dave made a glass too.
give uh, a full credit to the uh, creative force behind this. Uh, there is a company by the name of Doremus on the West Coast that uh, uh, we work with in the, both the first one, uh, the Day Made of Glass, and, uh, and the second one. And uh, in the first one, I was very strongly engaged. I've been the internal champion for this, uh, this, this notion of ubiquitous displays, highly interactive for probably the last 15 to 20 years uh, at, uh, at Corning, and therefore I was, uh, uh, made the contribution to the first one. On the second one, they got it, they kind of did it their own, and it's really a, a great company. Should also point out a little bit of a day made of glass trivia. Uh, you know the dad who you probably thought was just a house husband when you saw the first one? And he's actually, turns out he's a neurosurgeon. Uh, so he actually gained, his career didn't, didn't really take off after the video. The, the young lady who played the mother uh, did get a lot of work coming from this a very successful industrial video. Uh, the dad, the guy who played the dad, gained 40 pounds, so they had a lot of trouble uh, filming him from special angles. You notice how he was wearing the, uh, the lab coat and everything just to hold the... Uh, 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 just to, to hide uh, the, the change from year to year. So uh, between the two videos, it's been very successful, uh, 24 million views, and I've run into a lot of people from all ways of life that are really uh, intrigued uh, by this. And the basic theme behind it, of course, is ubiquitous connectivity or pervasive computing and communications, and to capture the imagination of the public and the technology community uh, uh, alike. However, we've got a long way to go. And, uh, one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be at this conference and so honored that I'm being asked to uh, give the keynote is the fact that you guys get it, okay? This is your life. This is what you're working on. And also, uh, the digital signage uh, 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 industry are the ones who are really taking risks where the conventional consumer electronics, I would say that they've become more risk averse over time. So that's really going to be the core uh, uh, theme that I'm going to be getting across. The conclusion is that here's where the rubber's hitting the road to actually get to this, uh, to this uh, future that many of us find so uh, attractive. So the basic themes uh, that uh, we tried to depict in, uh, in this is, uh, is basically that displays will become more vivid uh, and scalable. Uh, and uh, not just because we like big displays, but because they're more useful if they're larger. And also the immersiveness, the meaning that people can really immerse themselves in the content of the displays is, is, uh, is a big part of their utility. Uh, also the theme of the, the, the barrier between the virtual and physical world becomes blurred. Uh, and uh, I think this is an emerging trend. I think the younger generation is certainly going to be more comfortable than, uh, than, than uh, the people of my generation, but, but clearly this is a direction that we see is, uh, is going to happen. Um, display form factor, uh, freedom. The ability uh, where the, the form factor is not a limitation in the deployment of the display uh, is, uh, uh, is going to create a lot more diversity in applications. And finally, the inter inter user interface becomes more scalative, intuitive, and collaborative. Uh, I feel that the idea of uh, you know, one user, one user interface, and one device, I think those days are limited, and that we truly are going to be uh, uh, entering an era where there's going to be a lot more collaboration on the basis of the user interface and touch and, and gestures and, and, and so on. Now, um, the fact is, is that these waves of innovation uh, leading to this are being fueled in part by glass. Um, the scalability is in, uh, due in large part to the capabilities of glass that uh, my colleagues at Corning have been working on for the last uh, 25 years. The fact that everything's being driven thinner and thinner uh, and also embedding new capability in displays is also an important uh, uh, innovation that the glass has, has to participate in. And of course the immersive visual experience uh, all the, the, the very simplistic things like wide viewing angle, uh, higher resolution, uh, more vibrant colors, uh, each one of those attributes that's been under continuous improvement for, for so long and continues to get better is based upon, in part, the fact that the glass is becoming increasingly capable and higher quality over, uh, over time. So again, uh, just a, a little bit of a, a commercial uh, here is that uh, uh, the glasses that uh, Corning is engineering is leading the way. Uh, we have a, uh, a glass for uh, the 
amorphous silicon uh, uh, backplane, uh, which is the Eagle XG. We're developing new generations of glass under the family name of Lotus for high performance displays, which includes polysilicon, OLED, and uh, the, uh, the Organ the oxide semiconductor, which is a, a very uh, active area of innovation now in, in display. And also, and I'll talk more about this later, about the ultra-thin willow for the next generation of displays. Now, in terms of cover, uh, many of you have been uh, uh, aware or subjected to the marketing messages of, uh, of, uh, of Corning's Gorilla family. We're now in the third generation of that. And something that's a little bit more obscure and probably not of direct interest to this group is um, we also have um, one glass solution where you use the cover and you embed on the other side of the cover glass uh, the, the, the touch uh, uh, mechanism, the touch uh, circuitry. And this way it uh, reduces the, the, the thickness of the panel and also allows uh, manufacturing uh, for scale. So this is all good, but we've got so far to go. Uh, the fact is, is that I call modern displays are still bricks and boxes. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I've got a nice, very popular cell phone pocket, but I feel it, you know, it's heavy, you know, it's intrusive. Uh, and boy, it's a hog for energy, too. If I use it, uh, my, my, my cell phone, uh, it, it lasts a day if I don't use it, so which is kind of belies the real purpose of it. And TVs are still boxes. Yes, they're getting thinner and thinner, but it's not without the cost, uh, some cost. So in a way, uh, the fact is, is that the environment and the user lifestyle is oriented upon the limitations of the device form factor. You know, an example of this is that, you know, if you buy a large screen TV, you have to rearrange your furniture in order to accommodate the large screen TV. And it just makes you think, like, who's in charge here, you know? Uh, but that's just the way it is. Uh, they're, they're, they're static devices. Uh, they're still relatively expensive. Uh, and uh, the idea we're still a long way from being able to imbue our environment with these uh, you know, highly immersive uh, and compelling uh, video displays. So, and the other thing uh, which has been upsetting, at one point I was a huge fan of 3D. I organized a program within Corning that we were really going to attack 3D. <coughs> what a disappointment it's actually been uh, in, in, uh, in the home. Uh, people don't like wearing glasses. The other technologies aren't quite ready yet. Uh, and uh, I've actually myself only watched one, one movie all the way through in 3D in my home. It's just too isolating. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it takes too much concentration to do that. So, you know, in the traditional uh, applications, some of the, the most interesting extensions of technology and user experience have been disappointing. And also, there's a creepiness factor. And I sat in on a, on a CES uh, ex, so-called experts uh, a panel uh, a couple years ago, and we talked about the fact that it seems that your computer knows an awful lot about you uh, and keeps coughing up things about you, and anticipating what you're interested in, and, and so on. And, and it just feels kind of creepy. So this whole idea of the fact that uh, all these displays seem to be tracking us and following us and uh, and uh, somebody out there uh, has a, a, a profile about what you're doing, um, at least the older generation has some concerns about privacy. So, um, you know, we've made good progress, but I still think that we're a long ways away from, uh, from fulfilling the positive aspects of the day made of, uh, of, of glass. So, getting into the meat of my talk, uh, I'll just give my own thoughts as I call myself a dime store visionary, I guess. But uh, so what is it we actually aspire to? Let's set some targets at, at what would be a, uh, a vision of goodness uh, to take uh, these uh, component technologies to create this future. Uh, also, since I'm here to talk about glass, uh, you guys are going to be hearing a lot more about glass than you probably really care to. Uh, but the fact is, is Glass pays my salary, so um, you'll just have to bear with me for the next 45 minutes. So I'm going to talk about what is the historical emerging and the future role of glass in value creation. And then finally, I'll have some comments about why the digital signage and public display is so in critically important uh, in achieving its future. So this is my attempt at an aspirational statement for the future of, of display. Uh, 
The whole point of immersiveness is that it should serve the human connection and condition. Now, in that video that we did, uh, you know, one of the criticisms that we got of the, of the first day made of glass is that it all seemed to be about consumerism and uh, it seemed like fairly trivial. So, uh, my most substantive contribution to Day Made of Glass too is I told Doremus is that we really wanted to focus in areas where this future actually brings value to the human condition, that is in education and also uh, medicine. The whole point of having an immersive display should not be to separate ourselves from one another, but rather to bring us uh, together. Also, devices need to conform to lifestyle and the application. The information enhances life and not overwhelms or manipulates, meaning we still have lives to, to live. And I can think of, of nothing more pathetic than somebody with a, uh, with a, uh, a slate computer, you know, li living their entire human interactions and, and uh, their time uh, you know, through that computer itself. And also the fact that collaboration is driving the user interface. And again, so very clearly, is, and it's a theme I keep talking about. I mentioned it last year and at, 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 at our breakfast discussion, and, uh, and I think it has resonated, is that the whole point of this is to bring us together, not to separate us. So how can we, can we get there from here? And what can you expect from glass? So first, a historical perspective. And, you know, I know, uh, you know, that this, of course, I work for a big cl a company, and, and we try to uh, very carefully control the marketing messages. So even myself, at my uh, advanced age and experience, I have, all my stuff has to go through, through approvals. And they actually send a, a handler with me so I don't misbehave uh, to these conferences as well. So uh, the fact is, is when I did show them about this historical perspective, somebody made the comment, are you going to toy with them, Pete? Because the fact is, is when I talk about historical perspective, I'm going way, way back. This story starts at about 1500 uh, BC. And the fact is, is I'm, I'm using this for purpose. I wanted to point out that there essentially there are three main roles of glass in creating value for humans. Uh, the first one is as a durable, structural encapsulant, meaning to keep something in and something out. Uh, and a couple of examples here that are trivial, obviously a window. It keeps the weather out, but it still allows the people to interact with their, with their surroundings. The light bulb. It controls the environment so the, the filament doesn't burn out. Uh, and uh, even uh, the CRT bulb, which is glass, a very highly engineered glass, essentially that keeps the x-rays in and keeps the atmospheres out. And so as this theme, it's not the ultimate manifestation of the durable structural encapsulant, but this is the basic uh, utility that the Gorilla Glass uh, product line is associated with in order to create a level of protection for the sophisticated and somewhat vulnerable electronics in the, uh, in the modern uh, consumer device. The second role is that is of the enabling host, where the glass isn't active itself, but it forms a substrate or a template for something that, that brings activity. The first example I could dream up for this is like a stained glass window. It's not the glass that creates the color itself, but a staining that's applied to the surface. And if we go through, uh, and this is a picture of uh, a railroad lantern, and I'll, I'll be getting back to that. That was like Corning's first high-tech uh, 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 product on that. But as we go through other uh, examples of a host uh, for, uh, uh, for glass, uh, an optical fiber is a host for the optical communications. It doesn't shape the signal, it just provides a transparent conduit for that. Uh, LCD glass, essentially glass is passive in the operation of the modern display, whether it's an OLED, a, uh, a, a low temperature polysilicon, or, or whatever. The glass just provides the pristine surface upon which you create, uh, in the host, that you create this complex microelectronics. And so uh, one of the projects in my, uh, in, in, uh, in my portfolio that I'm very enthused about is using glass as a packaging material for, for three-dimensional IC, that is, a achieving the same results of Moore's Law of complexity, not necessarily by just making the features smaller and smaller on the chip, but being able to start stacking these chips uh, in the third dimension, and uh, you add a lot of value if you have a thin layer, microns thick, of glass in between those. This is one of the uh, uh, 
uh, what I think is a, an ultimate expression of the, uh, of the enabling host. Now, the one that I find the most interesting and, and is one of the areas that I'm trying to uh, create uh, a larger portfolio with is, is glass as a functional medium where the glass itself is doing something. And this is fairly simple. A, a telescope or, or, or eyeglasses, essentially, the glass is refracting, reflecting, or something like that to create uh, an, uh, an, an effect. Uh, more recently, you can make lasers out of glass where the glass is actually changing a signal creating a signal as well. Uh, and this is the area that I think is one of the most uh, exciting. And let's not forget the fact that, you know, starting at about 2000 BC, and nobody knows exactly when, the first purpose that glass was made for was as a aesthetic medium. In fact, the earliest uh, uh, shapeless globs of glass uh, by, um, you know, almost prehistory uh, probably was uh, man's wanting to emulate precious stones uh, by a melting glass in a, in a charcoal uh, fire. So the aesthetic value of glass is still extremely important. Another timeline, so I think this is my last one. I hope it's my last one, but uh, the fact is, is that the information age, glass has had a central role, so let's just reflect upon that. Uh, when radio first happened, uh, Corning uh, adopted a, one of its base technologies, the base technology for making light bulbs in order to make the glass envelopes of the vacuum tubes. And then when TV came along, we said, oh boy, that sounds great because you need a lot more of these vacuum tubes for a TV uh, than you do for a radio because it's much more complicated. But the fact is, which is also very common, you miss the real opportunity for uh, the one that's the easiest assumption. It turned out that the real value that Corning was able to bring was uh, the CRT uh, funnels, uh, excuse me, funnels and, uh, and, and panels. Uh, glass uh, became the backbone uh, of how the, uh, it, the, the signal, uh, the information gets moved from point A to point B through the optical fiber of the revolution. And of course, um, you know, Corning invented the first uh, uh, active matrix LCD uh, a substrate, uh, which is still a very robust product line for us. And finally, with the emergence of the mobile display revolution, developed glasses that allowed it, uh, the Gorilla glasses that allowed a thin, highly protective. So glasses had a very long participation in the information age. Well, let me give you an example of one that didn't work, okay? And, uh, and uh, uh, well, hold it. Let me give you one that worked. And so this is a, a brief history of uh, LCD. If we look at LCD, and when I first started in this project in the early 80s, it was far from clear whether or not that LCDs would actually make it, because there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of competition out there. But the first period uh, that I call viability, we were able to show that you could make a notebook computer uh, by uh, using an LCD glass, primarily because it was thin and also it ran on low voltage when the other display technologies needed higher voltage. But the industry really didn't start to take off on the notebook computer alone. Uh, the, it started to take off when there was a really functional value proposition of a desktop monitor. There was less eye fatigue by the use of a, net, a desktop monitor. And by this time, and this is occurring in the late, uh, in the late 90s, we started having the growth of the, uh, of the TV era. And it's not just TV. TV is our largest volume because TVs have large screens, but is the diversity of technologies, the fact that you can use LCD for everything. So its versatility really drove a lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, the growth. And uh, you know, glass has had a you know, very uh, robust value proposition for this. We combine a scalable manufacturing technology. This is a fusion process, a, war a way of making very thin, pristine sheet. Also, we innovated in the glass composition. It's a formulation by using an aluminosilicate glass system, which has turned out to be extremely uh, versatile for that. Essentially, the dimensions that the customer sees in terms of value, and I spend about 90% of my time just contemplating value products. I mean, there's lots of things that we can do with glass, but we have to understand the line of sight to what's the value it delivers to the end user. But the value in the LCD era was stable, clean, and flat. 
all right, because these are all requirements of the LCD platform. And um, the foundation of our value really is surface. Essentially, we're giving the rest of the glass for free. It's just the first few nanometers that count. And the foundation of this is based on the fact that the fine surfaces, until Corning perfected the fusion process, had to use a ground and polishing. And in the early 90s, I was showing pictures like this, very early 90s, to our customers and say, would you do want to make an LCD with this chopped up, contaminated surface or this pristine, beautiful fusion surface? And it turned out this is the direction that the industry, that the industry really uh, went. Because one of the things is, is that the surface can never be good enough. And, and if you look at this, this is an electron microscope. In this 92, this was actually some work that we did in my group in 1992. I wanted to know how small a scratch is no, is, is no longer important to the function of the device. And so we did stuff like get the finest diamond powder that you got and be able to put these calibrated scratches down to the submicron, essentially nano scratch in the glass. And we found under the right conditions that these nano scratches could actually cause a disruption to the, uh, to the uh, circuitry. And this is showing a break in a gate line, which is an essential part of the LCD uh, structure. So the point is, is that any technology worth winning at is, requires continual innovation. And we continue today even after 25 years, work on perfecting the surface. I take that back. There is no such thing as a perfect surface, delivering a better and better value in terms of the, uh, the surface. Because I know I'm going long. I'm going to uh, skip a, a, a head of this. Oh, one more, um, you know, one more uh, historical slide. I wanted to make a point about high resolution. Because this is one of the areas that I think is uh, 3D might have flopped, and it still may come back. Uh, but the fact is, is that uh, the Ultra HD, or the Quad, I think has got a lot of legs. Uh, and I think it's a very compelling value proposition. And I think it's a very compelling value proposition in digital signage as well, because you can have much more accurate, uh, higher level of content in the display. So the fact is, is since uh, I'm using it as a starting point, it's kind of a semi-joke, the Corning's first product was a railroad landing. This was telling a railroad uh, train to stop, and so it's essentially uh, one bit of information, stop or go. And then as you go through radio and versions of TV, it's gotten higher and higher, and now a given display has, uh, has uh, tens of millions of, uh, of pixels associated uh, with it. So, the fact is, is the trend of higher information density is something that's going to continue, on, and I don't think Quad HD is going to be the end. But uh, where it affects the glass is that um, is these new technologies, the higher resolution uh, LCDs and also OLEDs are creating a revolution in the glass industry because it's less about the commodity product uh, that we sell in mainstream and more for silicon and more about the advanced. And also the one risk that our customers are taking are innovations in the back plane. You'll hear about metal oxides as being a, uh, a display of the future. Uh, and it is a very radical change in the platform. And the big significance, I think, in the public display is that these displays, when they're perfected, will be much lower power consumption uh, than uh, the incumbent uh, uh, technologies. And for this, we've developed a new uh, glass family called the, uh, the Lotus family, which is specifically for the high performance displays, which I think is going to fuel the industry for probably the next five to 10 years of continuous improvement. And the Corning Gorilla Glass is a damage-resistant cover glass that you know, fits within the uh, durable structural and cap uh, capsule function. And also, it's got a clean aesthetic look. I mean, everybody wants a, the, a display device to look like an iPhone, a very monolithic look. But you can only um, take this uh, so far. The fact is, is that with Gorilla, uh, we've uh, essentially obsoleted ourselves every year for the past three years. And what's really driving this is, of course, competitive forces, but also that you know, our customers are expecting more and more from the, uh, from the portable devices. They want them thinner, they want them stronger, they want them more damage uh, uh, resistance, and we've been trying to keep up. The one area that I've been disappointed in is, uh, is how quickly it's being adopted uh, in the uh, large area, which is uh, primarily the domain of, uh, of public display. If we look at the overall volume growth of glass, 
we see that uh, the, uh, um, uh, the LCD substrates are relatively flattening out, but there's still uh, quite a bit of growth, which has to do with the worldwide penetration. There's lots of countries that, uh, uh, where the average uh, family doesn't have an LCD anymore. And of course, screens are getting larger, and, uh, and curiously, with LCDs, people are replacing them at a higher rate than what they did with the, uh, with the, CR, with the CRT. Uh, in Gorilla, primarily what's driving our growth is smartphone penetration, somewhat larger screens, incrementally uh, uh, larger, and a few new applications. But we've still been uh, having difficulty penetrating into the large area. So uh, about two years ago, we introduced a product that was uh, promoted with Sony. It was a cover glass for TV, where essentially the glass had one function, uh, somewhat protective, but primarily it was aesthetic function to create this very nice monolithic look. Well, uh, this monolithic, these are beautiful looking displays, uh, but it was preempted by an innovation that Samsung led, uh, which is a thin bezel design. And Samsung's approach was, we're not going to hide the bezel, we're just going to make it as narrow as possible. And this became uh, the trend. And also I wanted to reflect upon the value proposition of uh, the monolithic design. When the TV uh, is, uh, is off, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's monolithic, black, uh, very aesthetic uh, uh, ornamentation in your room. But you turn it on, and there's the bezel again. So there's something fundamentally wrong with a value proposition that only works when you're not using the device. And so I think it's a, it's a very important uh, uh, object lesson, well, for me personally, as well as, uh, as, well as Corning. But we're still looking for the big breakthrough for large area protective encapsulant role for glass. And we think that the, uh, the area of, of these uh, touch, collaborative touch, large size is, is one that will certainly pull it through. So now I talked about the terms of functionality of the glass is going to be an important theme moving, uh, moving forward. And uh, this is a, a quote from, uh, from my boss, uh, Jim Clapman, who's the president of uh, Corning Glass Technologies, and he points out that there's multiple opportunities, these are big problems to solve, but they're things that we think that uh, we can contribute to. Uh, but the fact is, is that it's going to be not necessarily making the glass better and better, although we will continue to do that, but it's to add functionality to the glass. Uh, we're working on some scalable, low-cost anti-reflective technologies, which are going to be so important uh, in the public arena. Uh, another one uh, is antimicrobial. Now, um, I think it's a little crude, uh, but our chairman uh, points out uh, that the fact is, is the, the handle uh, on, the, uh, on a men's urinal uh, in, a, in a public bathroom has less germs on it than the typical uh, uh, smartphone. And so the fact is, is there's a lot of value, which I think is very important in the public area to have an antimicrobial function upon the glass. And we're actually making some progress uh, in this area too. And also, flat glass is getting a little boring, and I've sponsored programs to create shapes where the basic theme of, instead of having a box or a brick, the device actually conforms to the application and the environment. And we're finding some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some pull in this area uh, as well. So, uh, progress on the antimicrobial surface. And we've got a long way to go with this, but we're able to show using uh, uh, one of the um, uh, um, uh, standards of measurement of antimicrobial that 99.999 um, of the microbes on a glass surface uh, within, I think, about an hour uh, actually were killed uh, by the interaction of the glass surface. And I think this uh, might be something of uh, great significance, and now we're just, uh, don't ask for this now, we're getting close, uh, we're just working with, uh, with scaling this up. Now, the other criticism that people had the day made of glass is saying, boy, it's going to take a lot of Windex for that world. And the fact is, is to have a fingerprint-free surface, a soil-free surface, that is one of the most difficult glass surface problems that you can imagine. Because that means the surface has to be both hydrophobic and oleophobic. And everybody's chemistry is actually a little bit different. And so we're making slow but steady progress in, in, uh, in uh, 
and making a smudge free surface. One of the things that we can do now is to have it easy to clean, where instead of having scrub, 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 that just one wipe and the, uh, and, the, and the contamination goes away. But this is another example of the functionality that we think that we have to add to the, the glass in order to extend its value in, this, uh, in these application areas. There are additional opportunities uh, for new functionality. Um, one of the areas is optical value add. Uh, we've done a lot of experimentation in bezel-free technology. And, um, uh, and again, you know, this is one area where, you know, why would somebody want a, a, a uh, display like this in the home, except for maybe as a, a, as a gaming module. So we're working with some of the industry leaders in this area and adding optical functionality to the glass cover so it actually obscures without distorting uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 uh, the uh, image, and what we're showing here is a, a three tiled panels where it does a pretty good job. This is just in our research lab. Uh, we did this uh, uh, collaboratively with uh, AUO, which is a leading panel manufacturer in uh, in, uh, in Taiwan. The other area that I'm personally really excited in, maybe totally out of uh, proportion to the value, is the fact that. If you've got a piece of glass uh, on the front of it, you can actually drive that piece of glass, if you're smart, to create sound. One of the issues with this basic, you know, this thin bezel, uh, thinner displays, is I don't know if you've noticed, the sound has gotten worse and worse and worse. To the point where I think that the average speakers uh, in a TV is, uh, is probably non-functional, at least in the, uh, in the public uh, uh, regime. Uh, this is an old idea. Uh, we're just adding a new spin to it. Uh, we figured out a way to, to excite the glass, and it turns out, purely by accident, not by glass design, that the basic attribute to have a glass that does a very good job of, uh, of, um, of reproducing sound is the glass has to have high acoustic loss. And that prevents the resonances so that would distort the sound. It turns out that uh, that Gorilla uh, is uh, much better than any of the competitive glasses uh, for reproducing sound. And so we're working with various uh, uh, customers to see if we can actually design this into IT uh, and uh, also a TV. And the key value is here is now you can see the sound is associated with the image. And that's a very compelling dimension of, uh, of uh, value. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is we've shown some tricks where you can actually localize the sound on the screen. So a race car goes across the screen and the sound follows it across. It's really very compelling and I think it might be effective for, uh, for marketing messages uh, as uh, well. And so the next wave um, we think is going to be created uh, by willow glass, which is moving glass so thin that it's actually uh, flexible. Uh, and uh, this allows the display, if you could make the display out of this glass to conform to the environment, maybe even be flexible. Uh, but I think much more importantly, it's for the next generation processing, the fact that you, it enables roll-to-roll -roll processes uh, as well. There's a lot of advantages uh, in, uh, over uh, using a engineering polymer for this because the glass has got a very high modulus, it's very stiff, it doesn't stretch, uh, and it's also capable of very high temperature. So you can create high performance microstructures on the glass that are possible by doing in polymer. So I'm just going to show a, a video of, uh, that does an introduction to, uh, to willow glass. <laughs> The big issue is the uh, edges. What are you going to do about the edges? So we're adding like a little tab on it that allows you to tension the glass without damaging the surface or without breaking it. Okay. All right. 
I'm really excited about it, but the, the industry, you know, if you, if you haven't noticed the basic consumer electronics uh, companies that are in display are it's essentially non-profit. And so this is a real push in order to get this technology out there. But I think the way to understand it is uh, uh, the flexible glass on this ubiquitous connectivity is to consider the uh, incandescent light revolution. Corning artisans made the first light bulbs at Edison that Edison did, but these were made by hand, as shown by the guy on the left. The invention in the 1920s of something called a ribbon machine to create a, uh, a just essentially a river of, uh, of uh, light bulbs uh, you know, coming out of this machine at extremely high rate was able to bring this down for the masses, the cost down for the masses. In the same way, I think there's a lot of hope for the Willow platform of being the basic for what I think is the future of display of digital wallpaper, where just about any surface can be imbued with the fact of interactivity and also the uh, uh, connectivity and also a, a high performance display as, uh, as well. I'm going to skip this slide because you guys, anybody in the audience can probably go through this slide with much more accuracy uh, than, uh, than, than I can because this is your space. But I'm enthused about this. Uh, the public display area just because of the wide diversity of applications and, uh, uh, and also of value, uh, value propositions. And so my hypothesis, and I'm starting to wrap up now, is that uh, the digital signage is a great testing ground for new value uh, propositions. So there are, therefore, I think this industry is probably the area where we will be taking risks to prove techn technology. Uh, and, uh, and actually stimulate the mass adoption. Uh, ad uh, adoption. Some of the value propositions that uh, are in our portfolio now of antimicrobial, uh, auto stereoscopic 3D, transparent display, bezel free and audio glass, I think have a very strong value proposition in your space that needs to be proven first before mass adoption in, 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 uh, in consumer can, uh, can happen. For example, 3D has not been a driver in home entertainment. But just imagine uh, at a point of sale marketing message if that display just reaches out and grabs the consumer as he's make, making the purchasing decision. I think that's extremely powerful and an actually a monetizable uh, uh, value to, uh, for the investment uh, in that. And transparent display has a multiplicity of opportunities. I, I haven't been on the, the floor of the uh, of the show yet, but I know there's going to be a lot of transparent displays. And I just think of where you're trying to decide what Coke you're going to buy, what, uh, what uh, soft drink you're going to go buy, to have Mariah Carey, you know, her image on a uh, refrigerator door beckoning you to come and buy a, a Coke, I think would be extremely powerful. And I think it's really going to be upsetting the basic idea of uh, value delivery of marketing messages by getting it where people are making much more efficient to get where people are making the, uh, uh, the purchasing uh, uh, decisions. So I wanted to point out one more. This was the most implausible effect in the day made of glass. I told you the, the first one, I essentially wrote the script for the first one. The second one, Doremus was kind of on their own, so by the time they engaged me, they already made up their minds. I told them, please don't show this effect because it's very difficult to explain, so I'm just going to show a, a clip. This is the beginning of the video you just saw. So you have images floating over her, her uh, little notebook computer. You know, I said, geez, I couldn't explain that. But geez, somebody has already done it. There's a company by the name of Displayer, and I don't know if they're here or not, but they've actually figured out a way they're creating water mist. You have to project on something. They're actually uh, putting some pretty cool images. It actually look like they're floating in air, but it actually is floating on this mist of uh, this water mist. Well, you aren't going to have that in the home, but I could imagine using this uh, in a public display. So this is just one more example where new technologies will be embraced by your community first uh, before uh, before the mainstream. So on a few final thoughts, uh, you know, will display technology deliver our aspiration? Uh, and so the point is, and I think it's very, really aware, is that only in part, uh, because it's so much about the systems and the integration and the behaviors and so on, that 
the gadgets are actually only part of the, uh, of the story. And so we have an old saying that when I first joined Corning, we say all it takes is just sand and imagination. Uh, but it takes a lot more than that. It takes a lot more collaboration uh, moving forward. And so Corning is privileged to contribute, uh, and, uh, but there's a lot of work left to make this vision real. And we feel that digital signage is in a key leadership role as well. And we uh, relish the thought of collaborating with you, with this community, moving to the future. Thank you.